The new entry in the Ghostbusters franchise is now out, called Frozen Empire, with the returning cast members of Afterlife, along with co-writer Gil Keenan, taking on the directing duties, with Jason Reitman contributing as a writer, but now stepping back as a producer. Afterlife was warmly received by the fans back in 2021, after the major backlash of the 2016 reboot. Afterlife was released during Covid, which may have had a knock-on effect to its box office, only recouping $204 million worldwide, pretty small for a big franchise picture, but it ultimately proved a success for Sony Pictures to greenlight a sequel in April the following year. Frozen Empire would return the Ghostbusters to New York, but the majority of the filming would take place at Pinewood Studios in England. With an increased budget from $75 million to $100 million, the second unit team would capture footage of New York for a number of action sequences and background plates of the city to help create the illusion that it takes place there instead of the often miserable backdrop of the UK. Sony Pictures didn't allow the press to see it until the very last minute, which often isn't a good sign, and as you might expect, it was pretty much savaged by them. Robbie Collin of The Telegraph awarded it one star out of five, calling it a shameful sequel. Empire Magazine gave it two out of five, and Mark Commode continued with the harsh treatment, saying he never laughed once during this supposed comedy. He felt the previous film, Afterlife, was nostalgia porn, and the sequel took everything and threw it at the wall to see what sticks. Negative reviews towards Ghostbuster sequels isn't uncommon. The sequel back in 1989 was slated by the critics, who felt it was a rehash of the 84 film, with Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert putting on their list of the worst movies of 1989. The reboot in 2016, well, everyone knows how that went down, and Afterlife fared better, but didn't set the world alight with glowing reviews. But it seems again that the fans aren't concerned with what the professional critics think, which is never much of a surprise when a sequel arrives to a big franchise with a large following with quotes banded around the internet saying, I don't care what the critics think, I enjoyed it. With the story, the Spengler family, along with Paul Rudd's character Gary, have taken on the role as the new Ghostbusters. They capture Hell's Kitchen sewer dragon, which causes some damage along the way, and the team faces public backlash and threats from Walter Peck, who is now the mayor of New York. To appease Peck, Phoebe is suspended from the field until she is a legal adult, which I wholly agree with, kids and teenagers can't be Ghostbusters. Phoebe is frustrated and goes out in the middle of the night to clear her mind and meets and befriends a ghost named Melody while playing chess, and they become close friends. Ray and Podcast have been collecting cursed objects at Ray's occult books. Nadine, played by Camille Nanjani, walks in and sells Ray this orb that once belonged to his late grandmother. Ray tests its PKE levels and the orb suddenly unleashes a psychic charge that causes natural disasters and critically damages the wall around the firehouse's ecto containment unit, which is now dangerously close to full capacity. Winston introduces the Spengler family to his privately owned paranormal research centre, where scientists under Dr. Lars Pinfield, played by James Acaster, study captured ghosts and cursed objects. This ancient orb proves troublesome, so Trevor, Pinfield and Lucky visit Nadim and discover the hidden brass-lined chamber, where Nadim's grandmother stood the orb and they decide to seek advice from a specialist at the New York Library. Phoebe's new friend Melody visits her at the firehouse where she takes a special interest in the containment unit. Unbeknownst to Phoebe, Melody is manipulating her on behalf of the trapped entity from the orb. I went into this film with low expectations. The early reviews didn't leave me with much confidence, and a few close friends of mine who had seen early previews shared similar views to the published reviews. After viewing it, I agree with most of the critics that it is a mess, but I think it's an enjoyable mess. Firstly, it does have too many characters, too many storylines, and struggles to focus on one of them to give it enough breathing space. The pacing of the movie whips along, feeling like a lot of footage has been cut out to meet a runtime. There are bits in the trailers that aren't in the film. The story, however, does manage to tie up the plot lines by the end, to be fair, but it was such an uneven journey you are left with what could have been a straightforward story that gets mangled up like a piece of string in the middle that eventually gets untied by the end. The legacy characters return along with the ones from Afterlife, and the film introduces a few more. It becomes very difficult to give them all enough screen time. Did they need to have the entire Spengler family be in Frozen Empire? The mum Callie had little interest in her father's job and what he did. Because she is related to him, she has now become a Ghostbuster, with little knowledge of what the tech does. Trevor has bugger all to do in the film and spends most of his time on screen trying to capture Slimer, feeling like a deleted scene from Ghostbusters 2 with Lewis. Podcast who was great in Afterlife sadly doesn't need to be in this film as he has little to do. It's very contrived how they bring back Lucky. Was she and Trevor in a relationship at the end of Afterlife? I don't know and I don't really care. And Frozen Empire doesn't make any attempt for them to further their friendship. And she, like the majority of the characters, have little to do in the film and just pops up randomly to serve the plot when required. 
The best of the new characters is Nadim, who makes some average dialogue sound hilarious. I laughed a lot during his scenes, and I think he should have been a Ghostbuster. James Acaster as Dr. Lars has a couple of good lines, that made me chuckle. I just wish he had more screen time. Technically, he is a Ghostbuster, but he disappears randomly during the finale and reappears during the end credits. A waste of a good character. As I'm a big fan of the original film, it's always nice to see the old cast return, but it's clear it's very much for nostalgia, and that's all. Thankfully, Dan Aykroyd gets a lot more to do in this sequel, and I was very happy he tagged along for most of it. Winston turns up now and again to tell the Ghostbusters off, or show them some new tech. Ernie Hudson is always reliable and worth watching. Annie Potts unfortunately doesn't get much to do, and again, doesn't really need to be in the film. But she is there for the fans, and of course, Bill Murray turns up, and doesn't do anything, but hey, it's Bill Murray. Despite its mangled script, I think tonally it matches the original 84 film, which is tough to do. Gil Keenan does a pretty good job with the direction, and the cinematography creates a visually interesting film. The score by Dario Marinelli, who worked with Gil on A Boy Called Christmas, does a good job with the score, adapting the music by Elmer Bernstein, like how they did with Afterlife. It's a shame that some of the music gets drowned out in the sound mix, with the sound effects taking over. The soundtrack is certainly worth seeking out, so you can give it a proper listen. The villain is your run-of-the-mill Freak of the Week monster. It has a little bit of a backstory that is creatively told, but this monster takes forever to appear on screen, and doesn't have much of an impact on the story for you to care, to be honest. With all these obvious problems, it did feel like a Ghostbusters film, more so than Afterlife. Afterlife had this indie movie vibe that had the Ghostbusters franchise bolted onto it. The story was simple and enjoyable for the most part, but clearly directed in a way to please the fans. The sequel again tries its best to please the fanbase so they can point at the screen and say, hey look, it's Walter Peck, etc. But it trips up very quickly as it juggles the franchise like a drunk that finally gets sober by the end. I would rate it 3 out of 5 at most, which to some may sound too high, but I did laugh a lot. The performances were generally good, it's well shot, and has some interesting elements of world building thanks to Winston's new team and technology. There's a lot of good stuff in the film, but it hasn't been given the time to breathe, as the pacing is very messy. If they had reduced the number of characters and focused on Winston's new team and the villain, I think it could have been a very good film. I would happily watch it again. Perhaps they will release an extended cut later in the year. I think moving forward it needs to move away from nostalgia and focus on the new characters. Sure, we can have Ray or Winston pop up, but let the new Ghostbusters take the reins and forget about trying to please a fan base of hardcore fans who, to be honest, don't really know what they want half the time. Sony Pictures needs to take the risk and do something new, and let go of the past to move forward. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to click the like button and hit the bell to be notified of my latest reviews. Big thanks to my patrons and YouTube members for supporting the channel. If you want to get involved and gain access to exclusive videos and take part in Q&As, follow the link below.